Hey, aren't, aren't I supposed to be happy? I mean, maybe you've kind of wondered in the middle of something, you're seeing everybody else live their blessed life on Instagram and whatever, right? So is, is that what God wants for me? Let's look at it. All right, so again, we're looking at this question, am I supposed to be happy? Doesn't God just want me to be happy in my life? And, you know, we can have this misconception in life about, you know, Christians are pretty much supposed to be miserable. You know, maybe before you got saved, you saw Christians that way, right? Because basically being a Christian is the end of fun. In fact, now it's time where, in fact, the more miserable you are, the more spiritual you probably are, right? You're supposed to have less money, go through more trials, difficulties, and you're not supposed to have any hobbies because they're probably going to become, you know, idols in your heart and in your life anyway, right? You know, the other side of it is, as Christians, we can feel like guilty for experiencing emotions of, I feel sad right now, and, you know, and am I supposed to feel this way? So, again, as Christians, let's just answer the question, does God ultimately want me to be happy? Well, there's a yes and kind of a no attached to that answer, really. Yes, God does want us to experience feelings of happiness, right? He wants us to have that. But, you know, on the other side of the equation, no, he doesn't want us to make happiness our God. Because in the world, what we encounter in the culture around us, you know, personal happiness it is our God. It's the way everybody makes decisions. You know what? Life's too short to be unhappy. Do what you want. Leave that job. Leave that person, right? And you know what? That mindset can influence us as Christians, right? And sadly, you know, it can happen in the context of marriage. Like people are in a marriage, you know, they're two believers even, and they're, they're together and one person looks at the other and just thinks and feels like, you know, you don't make me happy anymore, Right? We've lost that love and feeling. Now it's gone, gone, gone. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And so now it, we almost treat it like, you know, like a like a cell phone plan where we're like, it's time to upgrade, right? So we start to looking for the latest model. And so people will justify even adultery in those situations. God just wanted me to be happy. Or people leave Christianity altogether because they're like, you know what? I can, I can find a different way to be happy. I'm seeing all these options in front of me. And so I'm going to adopt a different way of life because that's what makes me happy. But as Christians, happiness is not our God. In fact, if you look at the definition of happiness in itself, you kind of break down the word. It starts with hap, which means luck or chance, right? It's happenstance. In other words, it's, it's this contentment that's actually derived from our circumstances. You could say it this way. Happiness is based on happenings, Right? So it basically means like, you know, something goes good, I feel happy. If it doesn't, I feel sad, right? So I'm promoted. I'm happy. I got laid off. I'm sad. I'm going on a date with her. I am happy. She doesn't like Chick-fil-A. I'm sad. In fact, I'm dumping her, right? It's over. It's over. It should be, all right? Just a little dating tip for you. But you know what? God wants us to experience something so much more than happiness that's limited by circumstances. He wants us to experience joy that transcends our circumstances. See, I don't know who said this quote first, but it's an awesome quote. It says this, happiness is by chance, but joy is by choice. And so I want to leave you two big ideas attached to us experiencing joy in our lives as believers. And number one is this, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. In fact, it tells us uh, that actually the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's our strengthening force. And in the book of Philippians, you know, the Apostle Paul wrote that letter in a time where he was in prison, right? Not ideal situation, not ideal conditions at all, but it's actually his most joyful letter that he wrote. And in Philippians chapter 4, we, we see such an example of rejoicing in the Lord, no matter what it looks like. And so in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, as if that wasn't enough. I'll say it again, rejoice. Why? Because joy is a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice to rejoice in the Lord. And it continues on in verse 11 through 13. He says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well fed or I'm hungry, I'm living in plenty or in want. I can do all of this. You've heard this, this is verse 13. I can do all this. I can do all things through him, through Christ, who gives me strength. 
And you know, maybe you've heard that verse and it can be applied in, in different situations, but the immediate context is, as we just said, it's in the middle of no matter what is going on, I can be content. The Lord strengthens me. Why? Because I set my mind upon him. I'm focused on him. I'm magnifying him. And as a result, guess what? Everything else is shrinking by comparison. We can choose to rejoice in the Lord, no matter what the circumstances. Second thing to help us experience this joy beyond, the, beyond what's going on is that we can choose to rejoice in the process. Rejoice in the process. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. At this point, it's like, James, what? Are you kidding me right now? Consider trials, difficulty, like, it's pure joy? What? And it says, verse 3, because, this is why, because you know that the testing of your faith, what you're going through right now, it produces perseverance. Let that perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Wow. James encourages us, hey, guess what? I want you to see what you're going through, no matter what it is. See it as an invitation for growth. See it as an opportunity. See it as a strengthening thing in your life. As I can tell you, no matter what it is, that process, that thing you're going through, see it through the lens of this is a process that's going to produce in me something precious. It's a process, but it's going to produce something in my life. It's a refining work. I'm going to be strengthened on the other side of this. If you'll choose to do that, I'm rejoicing in the process and what God's producing in my life as a result. He's working something out. So again, what are our, our big takeaways here? First of all, rejoice in the Lord. You can praise and worship him. Again, practically, we take the time to set our minds upon him. We worship him out of our hearts. We're singing. We're magnifying God in the midst of our circumstances that may be trying to magnify other things. Pay attention to where your mind is on, on God or on the difficulty. Number two, rejoice in the midst of the process. Rejoice in the process. See that difficulty as an opportunity. See it as a process that's gonna produce in you something precious, something that's gonna strengthen you. See it that way. Well, if this helped you, I hope it did. I encourage you to hit the like button, share it with somebody that may benefit from it. And again, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're always putting out more and more content. Hit the little bell, you'll get a notification when we post something new. And hey, we hope to see you here real soon.